Hey guys, back with another video. Um, this one is the continuation of the Darksiders war guy from last time. And uh, I'm just going to finish this one by inking it. I'm trying to look for the ink. Where'd it go? There it is. Okay. So, here we're going to start by inking all the darker spots. Get the big blocks first. Block everything in. Then I'll go for the details in the end. So, let me start off by saying which ink I'm using. Again, I'll show you guys the brand. It's this one, the Chloe Miller Ultra Draw. Really good ink. Don't worry, I'm not sponsored. I'm not selling you guys nothing. Yeah, that's, that's the ink I use. And the brush I'm using right now is a Princeton. This one is not natural hair. This one's synthetic. It's fine, though, because I'm not doing details. But I really like to use the um, natural hair brushes for the details. And the brush I'll be using for the details, this one's natural hair. It's sable. So I think that's horses or something. But it's the Princeton. I don't know, not Princeton. Um, it's the Windsor & Newton series seven this one's awesome it's a number two so it's not too big and it's not too small it's um it's good for like most detailing for me because i don't usually do too many fine lines it's usually like it's more um yeah i'm too lazy to do too much fine detail but I'll, I'll leave that depends all right so i'll start here by inking all the blocky shadows So I'll give some tips. I already sent them in the last video, but when you're inking, try to keep everything nice and loose in the beginning, right? You, you want to get used to the brush again. So it's like kind of warming up. So here I'm just going to go for all the parts. And remember, hold it very loosely. Not very loosely, but you want to hold it loose enough that you feel comfortable with it. And it's not going to fatigue your arm or anything, your hand. So when you're inking in big blocks, you can leave sometimes, like when you're filling stuff with ink, right? You're not going to 100% get everything always, like here. And sometimes you can leave it and it gives like a cool effect of like reflected light. So reflected light is any of the light that bounces off the environment and lands on the character from the bottom. So let's say the light source on the top, the shadows on the bottom. Some of those shadows are going to be illuminated by the reflected light in the environment that bounces off objects and hits that. Okay. Right, let's continue. More shadows. With some of the hair, I don't. I'm not afraid to accidentally black it out. It's fine because the hair is white. So what I'm going to try to do later is I'm going to add in the hair probably with like a, uh, with white paint or something. Sorry if the camera is a bit shaky, since it is attached to a lot of wires. And everything is moving right now, so. But yeah, here I am adding more shadows. If there's an object on top of another object, it's going to be leaving cast shadows underneath. So what I like to do is I, li I like to draw the shadows that will be there because of the object underneath. So the shadows of the arm. Then I'll just add the shadow of the object that's on top of it right after. So look here, for example, this piece of armor here, I'll add the shadows that are already in that piece of armor, right? So all of its line work, all of that. And then the shadows of the object on top. So it's pretty much the outline plus the shadows, see that? You can always just keep going back in editing, but just don't overwork some certain stuff, especially in ink, because you'll just end up with a black blob, and you don't want that. 
suppose add some more shells. I don't want to darken this too much because I know I'm going to add like some kind of a mid-tone here so I could show that he has a face. I want to make sure the outline for the head is pretty dark because he does have a lot of objects surrounding him. So if you got a lot of things in the drawing, right, and you want it to be more visible, make the outline thicker because if you do that, the viewer can always see what you've outlined the most. Unless, of course, everything around it is also outlined too much and you don't want to do that either because if you do that, you'll just end up with a lot of things that are outlined and now... The thing about drawing is that it's all comparisons. So, everything in comparison to everything around it. So, if this has a thick line, that means it's probably... You want to be more clear than stuff with a thinner line. And let's say something has... So, what else do you compare when you're drawing? Yeah, and it's perspective. So, certain things will be bigger and closer than things that are smaller and farther. So, drawing is all comparisons. And you're making these judgments all the time when you're drawing. And that's why drawing is not like a passive activity. That's only once you like got everything figured out and you planned your drawing. Then it could become more passive and more like a flow flow state type of an activity. But um, until you've planned it, you're going to have to make many conscious, conscious decisions about what you're drawing. It's not something that you just do out of your head. Like, um, when you see, like say for example, you know Kim Jong-ji. He, he's a master. And when you see him draw, he's making all these decisions in his head. But because he's done it so many times, it just seems effortless. But it's not. It's, 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 he's just used to it now. He's, got, he's making all these decisions, all the perspective. He doesn't need to use a perspective grid like most of us when we draw. Why? Because he, he's, it's in his head. Like, he doesn't just draw in perspective. Like, he's doing all those calculations in his head. He doesn't need to just uh, draw it out first, plan it, and do all that. He's already drawn so much. Like, I hear a lot of people, when they ask me for advice in drawing, or send me a question or an email or something asking for advice or any questions about drawing. And they're like, I've practiced, I've practiced this thing or that thing for a couple of months and I don't see any improvement. I'm like, of course, it's only a couple of months. Like you, you don't get good in a couple of months. If you can, then everybody that leaves an art school is going to be good. And that's not the case. It's, it's not a sad thing, but it's, it's an honest thing. It's just, that's the way things are. If you want to get good at something, you have to do it consciously, not just do it passively. You have to be at it all the time. You have to make sure. See, right now, I'm, I'm kind of drawing passively because I got off topic and I started talking about this topic and I haven't been making a lot of decisions in my drawing and I've been just drawing with this brush. But honestly, it came out kind of good. But you can't aim for better when you're not consciously doing something. You have to be thinking and in it while you're doing it. you got to be focused, laser, laser focus. So let's come back here. I don't like how this part's turning out, but it's fine. All right. So let's go here. The head is going to be casting a shadow on this stuff. All right. Let's get the bottom of the sword. I remember last time when I was drawing the sword with the pencil. It took forever. I think it was more than half the video. But it shows you how sometimes a simple, an object that you might think is simple will take forever. It's always the objects that seem simple that are always the most difficult. Sometimes I like to do this dry brush effect. Not dry brush, what's it called? It's like a textured effect when I'm drawing a blade. It just gives it like a nice, it gives it a nice feel. I don't know how to explain it. See, that's what makes style. It's certain biases you have when you're drawing. Or mistakes. Sometimes mistakes are beautiful. Sometimes. Like if I spilled ink all over this, I don't think that would be beautiful. Let's, draw, let's just imply a bunch of faces here. The skulls are dead stuff.
kind of liking this so far. Okay. What I like about this brush is that if I use this brush to make fine lines, it would be terrible. It would take forever. I mean, look at this. For me to make straight lines with this, it's, it's a nightmare. I don't like this brush at all. I mean, I like it for what I'm doing right now. But if I'm going to be doing fine lines, I'm going to pick always a natural hairbrush. Because with the plastic ones, they always like deform into this like, see that mess right here? And I wash this all the time. You darn good. This was like a, I mean, this thing about brushes, if you want a good brush, you're going to have to spend money. And that's just the sad reality out of a lot of art tools. The art market, I feel, is a scam. The more you spend money does not necessarily mean you'll have better supplies. Like, I think, like, look at Copic markers, for example, right? I'm not knocking on them. I think they're awesome. But some of these Copic markers, like, are $50 a pack of, like, how many? I forgot, but, yeah, some, some of them are scam, man. And there are other markers on the market that are almost the same. And they're a fraction of the price. But I think most of the price comes from the shipping. Because in Japan, I heard they're actually cheap, and they are made in Japan, I think. So, yeah. It always comes down to shipping these supplies because some supplies, you know, they got liquids in them. So they are shipped under other, what is, what's it called? Under special conditions, probably. Maybe that's why they're expensive. But um, you shouldn't be using, I feel, markers to color if you don't know how to use paint. You should always start by painting. If you want to learn how to color, true basics of coloring, you should be oil painting. But of course, not everybody can get oil paints and doesn't have the room to oil paint because if you oil paint in a confined space, it can lead to you breathing in all those fumes from oil painting. So what I recommend is the next best thing, acrylic. It dries fast, you can take it anywhere. It dries almost immediately. Unless you use certain mediums that you could combine it with the paints. And you know, then you could paint better. I mean, not better, um, paint on. You could have the paint dry slower. So that's something pretty cool. And, um, but if you use oil paint, you could, they got these oil paints out now that are, um, they're water soluble, which is pretty cool. And water soluble paints, you could just mix those with water like you do with any other paint that is water based medium. But, um, what was I saying? But yeah, you got to make sure you paint if you want to learn how to color. I would not advise going straight into markers because with markers, you need to know how to make sure that when you lay down the colors, that the brush strokes are not visible. I see a lot of people color. Even I've even seen some professionals do this, where when they lay down the stroke of the marker, you could see the... So let's say you're coloring in something, right? And you want to make sure that it's... So let's say we're coloring that in, right? We colored it in. And it looks like that. That's distracting. If we want to color something in, right? Say you want to color in a square. Let me dip that in here. You want to make sure that it's colored uniformly. There's nothing distracting in it. Sometimes with some markers, you see people like they'll go even over the brush stroke they've had before, and then things just begin to look distracting, you know? Because sometimes they don't know how to color in slowly. Or sometimes they try to cover a big distance in a small amount of time or a small amount of brush strokes. And so if you learn how to paint, you learn how to manage the medium itself. Like with the tools, it's not always about the tool itself. It's more about the medium you're working with. Like if I'm working with ink right now, I have to learn how the, how the ink behaves, how the ink absorbs into the paper. Like right now, I could ink whatever area I choose to because I'm not worried about how long the ink it takes to dry. Because if you use another brand of ink, which, look, use whatever brand you want, but I'm comfortable with the ink that dries immediately because I don't like inking from top to bottom, right? Because sometimes my hand will go somewhere on the thing and then it might smear the, the ink, right? So I choose to use a medium that I'm comfortable with. That's the whole point about experimenting with the tools and the different mediums. This is why that's an advantage you get from art school also that you get exposed to all these different mediums. But I've never went to art school, so I have to do this on my own. So I have to take time and, you know, energy to go and do all this stuff. It's, that's the thing about this whole art thing is that you can't just go off somebody's advice. Like even me right now talking to you, don't take everything I say 100%. Go figure it out for yourself. Because you got to make sure that things are true for you. Sometimes somebody will say something. And then might just not ring with you. So you got to go figure it out for yourself. 
that might be bad advice for some things. But I feel most things in life, you're going to figure it out. So, especially if it's your own thing, you know what I mean? Like, like sometimes you'll hear, you'll hear people talk. It might be right for them, but man, you got to figure it out for yourself. So, especially when it comes to making your own art. Nobody could teach you how to draw. You got to draw. Because drawing is about seeing. You got to use your own eyes. Everybody sees things differently. But of course, all the fundamentals are the same. So, <laughs> don't. Just draw stuff crappy and then go say, Oh, it's because I see things differently, man. Yeah, don't do that. Kind of gonna go a little bit more loose with the rest of it. Something getting bored on this. Just a little tired. It's like, what is it, three in the morning right now? I'm not advocating waking up for too long. Everybody should be sleeping a good amount of time every day. Also, when it comes to learning, you need to get a good amount of sleep because I heard it's like a kind of like your brain defragmenting itself when you sleep. Organizes all the information you learn through the day. So technically, you're learning while you sleep. I'm going to make sure to keep this arm, arms outline nice and dark so it's more visible. Gauntlet is really cool. A lot of these characters in these games, they got really cool designs. Like, I don't know what it is now, but a lot of video games that come out, I feel like the designs kind of suck. Not knocking on them, but... Like, if any of you ever played League of Legends, this might be a controversial opinion, but I'll say it. Some of these new champions, man, their design's kind of boring. I mean, like, look at all the old champion designs. And now they're pumping out, like, a new champion every, like, week or something, but... Yeah, I quit that game ages ago. I still when I was younger, but it's a cool game. It's good times. I mean, I'll say it again. I think I said it in the last video or something, or another video. But Skyrim is the best game ever made. If you don't agree with me, comment below. Probably because you never played it. It's a good game. But you see the character designs in that. They're funny looking. There's something about the game that makes all the designs look cool, especially the weapons. But yeah, you don't really see that many new games that are awesome out lately. And I think the main reason is just because of the, the graphics demands. You know, that's very limiting because they don't want to create something that the graphics aren't too good. Because then when another game that comes out with better graphics, that's probably going to sell more. And that's the sad thing about a lot of art in these games though, is that it takes way too long to do. And so everybody that's working on it is overworked. And so they just pump out the simplest stuff they can. And it's not their fault. It's like, you got to keep a job, you know. It's like, you got to empathize with some of these artists, man. Like, you got to do what you got to do to keep your job. You can't just be working on the coolest stuff all the time. Like at the end of the day, it's his job. It's a living. So if you're doing what you like, drawing what you like, consider yourself blessed. You know? Yeah, that's beginning to look cool. I'm getting a bit reckless with this, but it's um it's beginning to piece itself together. And when you go in later with the details, it's gonna get a bit easier. And here I'm being a bit abstract with it. Because I know I could kind of go in later and render it a bit more. But yeah, it was like the flow state stuff I was talking about, where you could kind of just you got most of the fundamentals and basics down and you could just go in and do whatever. And come again later. I'm gonna kind of dry brush that light. I'm gonna start off from dark. From dark to not too dark. It's like kind of dry brushy. But yeah, what I was saying before about different mediums, make sure you experiment with different mediums, especially when it comes to color. Because the thing about color is that it's very difficult. I mean, it's not very difficult. It's um, it's the drawing part that's difficult. A lot of good uh, drawers, right, they can 
they can they can paint pretty well. But if you're just good at painting, drawing is still difficult. So make sure you learn to draw. Like you don't not every good inker is a great penciler, right? You gotta make sure that you know how to do both. If you wanna be a great artist, it's, it's important to get good at all of it. Some may say, no, it's not not really, you just gotta specialize in something. It's like are you gonna be great at it? I don't know. I think if you wanna be great at something, you gotta learn all 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 about it, all the ins and outs. You can't just focus on one thing. Of course it's difficult. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying like if you, if you know you gotta do something, try to do it. So remember the whole time I'm doing this, I'm thinking about the light source. And the light source, I'm thinking is kind of like to the side, out this way. And so that's why whenever I draw shadows, they're usually thicker on any objects on on, on this side, right? On, on its own. To his right. So stuff like that. Not right. Honestly, I, I think it looks a bit sloppy, but once it starts to pull itself together, it probably begin to look alright. Who knows? Might look like doo doo in the end. You never know. Keep going. Just add in some skulls here. And what I wanted to do with this leg is that I wanted to. Keep it a bit on the darker side. So I'm going to dry brush it in. I don't know if the sound is going to show up in the video, but there's a car that's pretty loud outside. But I think this mic only picks stuff that's near it, so I don't know. Hold on. Alright. Now let's draw that spider. It's a cool looking spider. I'm just a crab. I forgot what I said in the last video. Spider crab. That looks like Predator from that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Blocking all the shadows. Because you can always add in like very blocky shadows and kind of just render them in slowly into the surroundings. I really like that shadow. It came out looking cool. Everything's about shapes. So you see here, I'm just interlocking kind of triangular. Shapes, pointy shapes, right? Probably got black in the mouth, so yeah, it gives it a cool look. See, I feel like I could only go with fine lines with this brush, is if it's already dipped into ink. It's not like the Windsor and Newman brushes that let me just stay with a lot of ink in them for a while. The ink doesn't flow too well in synthetic brushes. There's like really high-end synthetic brushes by the Princeton Company, but uh, I'm not going to afford that. All right, it's getting better. That's a pretty cool line. Let's see if I get some fine lines here. Yeah, it is working pretty well. I just don't want the time to keep doing that with this brush. These eyes are going to be a challenge because here I want to make it look like these brow ridges or eye, whatever eyebrows. I don't think spider crabs have eyebrows, but it should look like there's visibly some kind of a ridge here. And then these eyes sit within it. 
Yeah, kind of. Looks a little better. And draw like a big gash over here. Because, yeah, you got smashing the head minus sword. So it's not a fun way to go. Add some blood or something. That looks pretty violent. here I remember what I said about the thicker lines so see I could add it here and it makes the gash look more visible right so that the thicker line makes them look more disconnected from the figure behind them. Let's add these fangs, wherever they are. Now, I know it might look like I'm getting a little careless with the brush strokes, but it kind of adds to the texture sometimes, I feel. Sometimes it doesn't, but I'm willing to take that risk. Because you can always fix it later with some white ink or something. I used to use the Kurotaki white ink when I would ink, right? But because I started coloring, I don't like using it anymore. I use the Posca white markers. The Posca white markers are acrylic, so they um they just kind of blend it when I use acrylic dyes or watercolor sometimes. Not watercolor, like the concentrated watercolors, because those are more like dyes. So they just dye that acrylic that I've put over the Thanks. One thing you gotta watch out for is when things kind of not overlap, what's it called? Like when they're too close to each other. I forgot what the word is called. Yeah, when they're tangents. So a tangent. Uh, it's like this. So let's say you got a circle, right? In geometry, this is a tangent line. It's a line that connects with something. Now in art, that could look annoying. So let's say you got a face over here, right? And you want to draw another face or another person next to them, right? You're not going to do that. That, that. that looks funny. So what are you going to do? You're going to have a face here. And then the other face is going to be like that, right? Because it's just weird when everything is standing so tangent. Like, when everything is uh -huh. tangent, it can get very distracting because it looks more like a pattern than a natural environment. Because in natural environments, things don't just place themselves exactly where you want to see them. As an artist, your job is to do that, to put things exactly where you want to see them, but make it appear natural. Unless you're like working on like patterns or what's it called textures or certain things that need to appear like they're man-made geometrical patterns then you can start doing that as much as you want but if you're working on drawing i mean cartooning or doing story art or stuff like that you don't want to do that you want to make sure things look as natural as possible and as little manufactured as possible let's do a really thick line here because this stuff is in the foreground 
and you can even make the line dirty like that, like very rough and textured. Because it doesn't really matter. And you see with brushes, you can get all these different textures this different way you hold it. Like right now, I'm just pushing the brush forward. You see that texture I'm getting? See, that's one thing that kind of pisses me off about AI art, right? Is when if somebody makes that stuff through AI and says they call themselves an artist, it's like, what is an artist? I don't even know. Sometimes I don't even like to call myself an artist, even though I'm making art all the time. So, it feels like it's an overused word now. Everybody likes to call themselves an artist. But, um, I mean, you see artists a long time ago, they make their own paint. Do I have time to make my own paint? No. Am I an artist? I don't know. So is the meaning of the word going to change? Is it going to mean if you could make stuff off computers now? By telling it what to draw, then that was your vision? Who knows? So let's get these spikes back here. So what I'm going to do is to make them look like they're further away. And I'm going to make them start from a shadow. And then slowly just come out of it. Good. This way, remember I said about the tangent line? So it looks like it's attached to this. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that it's not starting there. You know what? No, I'm gonna fill that in. <laughs> you know, I think I made a mistake. Let's add some more shadows here. With the dry brushing, you can really fill in a lot of space in a little amount of time. So make sure you can find your brush that can do textures that you want, that can do it in a timely fashion and in a larger amount of space. So with these, I wouldn't be able to do it with another brush. But with this brush, it's not a paper brush for doing these kind of textures with them. Thicker lines for closer things. So this here is the close one of the closest things to the viewer. So we're gonna create a thicker line. See here, I kind of go with the object when I'm shading in. So that gives the illusion of shape. And they all the drawing is illusion. You think you see something that's there, when it's not. It's just marks. So you can always do all these different kind of. So you want to shade in with the shape, and it gives like a really cool look. I think I said it in another video, but when you, you got to render with the perspective too. Or things will start to look off. Let's add like a cast shadow on that. Shade in some more around it. 
Later on, I like to, after the inks, sometimes I'll go with black color pencil, like Prisma color, and add some other tones. So that's always fun. Not a crab leg in the background here. I'm just going to leave that. I really like those shapes. Two spikes on it. Might have made a mistake back here. Not sure. Kind of just looks like alien parts. Whatever. myself together. It's beginning to look more, uh, what's it called? More whole. Let's darken this side of the leg more. That look that leg looks really long. <laughs> but um Try to put that here and then all right now it looks a little bit thicker so it looks like it's fine. Let's increase the outline around that hand. I think it's time to whip out the smaller brush. Let me finish to wash off the ink. Always make sure to wash off the ink off the brushes with a little bit of water. And then go wash them later. Don't forget that either. Take care of your brushes, they last forever. Best thing about brushes is that if you get a good you get a good brush, 
and you maintain it, wash it, and all that, it lasts a lifetime. Maybe. I'm going to start just doing the rendering and all of that. Smaller lines. So with rendering is that I don't like to just follow the, what's it called? With rendering I just follow the perspective and the shape of the object. So here this, this finger kind of, it's the thumb so it kind of goes just back. And then these fingers here, they go down. So I want to follow that here and then just go like that. And then add some more shadows to this part since it is on the bottom and these hands are going to be casting a shadow on it. I want it to look less blurry. So I want the hands to be visible here. So I'm going to be adding a shadow to that. not liking that ribbon too much but it is what it is the stuff that gets overlapped make sure you place a shadow on it makes it look like it's in the back see that it's in the back so I had like a little rip to it Gives it a little bit more personality. Don't keep things boring. Why does the camera keep me all fuzzy? Oops, what was that? I thought it was ink for a second. Alright. So I had these ribbons here. Remember, the sword tilt is circular, so you want to abide by that. So you see, in certain videos where I don't have a warm-up, the brush feels stiff and all that. But here, I feel like in this video with this brush, it feels... Uh, like it's easier to do the thinner lines. So I think the hand turned out all right. Looks decent. So I know in another video I said don't use the paper towel when you dip the brush and all that, but um, I have these cotton towels. They're a bit different. It does. It's not too absorbent, like paper towels and all that so I'm starting to use one but I still use the paper to test the line quality and all that so I'll just sometimes I'll just take the brush and test out a few lines before I put on this paper sometimes before I ink I like to use a kneaded eraser on the pencils so it's not too dark so it kind of have a better sense for the values but I didn't feel like doing it for that video I mean for this drawing That pattern is going to be difficult. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that, that middle of the sword is dark. Right. And I want to make sure 
that stands out from the edge. So we're not going to touch the edge at all with the edge at all with the brush. And we're going to make sure that we're just going to put in some kind of an interesting pattern. Um, a really good artist that does shading with like alternating lines is if you look at Mark Silvestri's work, he's a genius when it comes to that. Like he'll fuse lines that are going in different directions and it makes it in a way not distracting. And it looks very cool. It gives it like a cool texture to it makes it look unique like in nature there's no such thing as lines so for us to use them in our drawings it's it's a weird thing like lines man it, it's not, nothing is outlined in nature yet we make a big fuss when we outline stuff in our work line work and all that so just combine your lines to make Loves like you know in painting you're just using strokes right not lines and all that and so the purpose of lines is just to make these shapes don't think of them in terms of lines think of them in terms of shapes and your work will come out different like what am I using these lines for what am I using this line quality for what am I using this sorry if I'm not using the correct terms but yeah you have to think of why you're using whatever you're using. I'm not liking how it came out too much. Maybe it's because I'm not finished. See, now that's coming out distracting because I'm beginning to overlap. Should have thought it through a little bit more. Oh, maybe just pulling stuff together now. Let's add some more texture to it. Time for the hair. Actually, I'm going to get that hood in real quick. Ah, that wasn't good. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to leave these black right now. So I have the hair in black, but then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in with the acrylic marker later. I think I said it before and then just white it in. Sometimes when you're inking and you got pencil lines underneath and you can't really see what you're doing because of the pencil lines, squint your eyes and then you could like blur out your vision. 
and you begin to see how the values look. See right now I'm using that dry brush to get that pattern in. I'm happy with that. Sometimes if you use like the side of the brush after you've used it like that, it makes this like blade and you could get like a really precise line sometimes. Not too happy with that, but it's not too bad. Remember that was the skin here. I want to black it in. And use dry brush. All right. Time to lift off some of the pencils. Let's go through stuff we can thin with markers so there's no risk of smudging. Forgot to add that in here. It's kind of like another leg. spikes to it. My spikes could help point at the figure, right? Giving it a bit more visibility. Because you could always use spikes or certain arrow looking objects, right? And they help you point at stuff that you want the viewer to see. It sounds ridiculous, but it works. Arrows and pointed objects always guide a viewer's eye. Most of the time. Depends on how you do it. If you do it right. Forgot to erase the rest of what I needed to erase. Just remember where the ink was. Don't touch that with the eraser. I like about the kneaded erasers, it's not too rough and it doesn't rip off the ink off the page. Sometimes when you're inking and then you erase after it, the ink comes all off along with the eraser. And I remember here because I drew the sword so many times that it left an imprint and went onto the page just because of the sheer amount of times I drew it. I think I drew like what five, six times. It's a difficult object to draw. Now, let's make this the sword a little bit, the inside of it a little bit more taller. Just give it some more volume. Those faces that are in the sword, I want to make them look like they're in there. Bit more. And then when I'm done with the ink, I'm going to go in with white and then add some more to it. I think I might be overworking it. Alright, let's just 
draw this in. Let's darken the hair a bit. Darken the hood. Distracting now. because this is a circular like object or cylindrical these shadows are going to be following that type of shape remember always follow the shape so it gives volume to an object light and dark are supposed to show shapes
And that's always what rendering does. Rendering shows the shape of the object. Gives it volume. Makes it feel like it's really there. Sometimes when I'm using a brush and it begins to take too long, I'm like, I should just take out the pen. But then I realize, like, the reason I use the brush is because of the shape of its strokes and all that. I kind of messed up on here. Whoops. I, I forgot that I left those on purpose. I should have went to sleep. See, I'm beginning to overwork that, and that's not good. So now i got to make the whole thing have a darker outline. Make sure to cut shadows thicker because it's on the end of a shadow. I mean, the outline is thicker because it's at the end of a shadow. In the beginning of the shadow, you begin to put a thicker line. So you kind of keep copying that pattern over and over until you kind of left with the result you want. There we go. See, that looks way more volume than before.
I think I can fit there. Now let me get Come on, buddy. Hug. Eyes up there some more. Let's get the shadows in the shadows a little bit more shadow. Gives a nice feel to the, to the folding, to the clothing. So let's just follow the shape and don't touch the spikes that are coming up. Maybe just get the spikes that are in the background. Alright, that's cool. I want to keep those eyes bright. Sometimes I like it when the ink begins to gray a bit, when it becomes less saturated in the brush, because it kind of like leaves a, I like to leave that for the more stuff, the stuff that's more in the foreground. Gives it a feel like it's closer. I want to make sure to keep the, the parts on the outside more white and brighter, because if I don't, it'll blend in with that background. I'm going to make sure all the shadows that are on the insides, that they're darker, because then it will start to make the outside stand out more. So I'll start to black out the insides a bit more, because I want to make it look like it's further, like there's a space inside the gauntlets.
screen is a little bit better. Once you start to zoom out and look at it with a fresh eye, it looks a little bit better. I'm going to start to render in the crowd that I... Really honest, I'm going to draw a lot of armor. I mean, armor is just a pain. Pain on me. I want to make sure that he's less better than the dude on top here. So I'm going to make sure that I increase the... Uh, i to take advantage of mid-tones here. Add some blood to this. Then add that shadow underneath the eyes. This one, it feels a bit distracting, honestly. I want to add a pattern to it. I think that if I add a pattern to it, it might get a bit more distracting, so I'm just going to render it in, honestly, with, like, just shadows. I feel the main reason it's very distracting is just because of how white it is compared to everything else. So let's just add some dry brush to it. Try to make anything that's high contrast in it just disappear, so let's just keep adding more. More of those dry brush patterns. Let's give it some texture and stuff. you see when you have like a spot here that looks like it's an empty space an empty spot in space and then you have spots here that are white it makes it look like they're both the same thing well, that's the thing if you don't have color the two main values are black and white so the things that are white tend to look the same in the drawing things that are shadows and black tend to be looking the same also so it can get confusing especially when the background is white too It looks pretty much finished. I still think there's something off with the face. I can't put a finger on it, but I know what it is. I think it's that that hoodie. Not hoodie, the hoodie. I'm just gonna add that to it. And then 
put some well, let me get some more dryness to this brush more to the bottom of the these edges here just to take out that very stark white and add dry brushes to the middle of the sleeve yeah it seems very dry hard to get all of it. it's a solid it's a solid ink on there It's not worth it. All right, I'm going to start erasing some of the pencils. And... All right, pretty much finished with the main inks. All right, now I just want to put in like a gray tone because I want to make sure that everything is just a little bit less bright. And that the highlights are the brightest things. some of the ink begins to come out when you use some water on the page that's all right with me right now because i wanted it to do that so what i'm going to start to do now is i'm going to use a little bit of charcoal to give a little bit of clouds to the background Now I want to go in with uh, a 
Pascal Mokri. And Adam Burr. The main highlights. up there.
lesson is finished. I just gotta find a place to sign it. I'm sure sign it. I think right here would be good. It seems too yeah it's hard to sign this one and look I still gotta use the black color pencil I didn't say what I'll use
one's pretty much complete. I like how the eye turned out here. Let me make this part a little bit darker. I want to take less away from the eyes. I'm going to gray it out. Only thing I would probably change is I would have improved this gun a little bit more. But overall, pretty happy with it. I mean, probably by next week I'll probably look back and I'll be like, what is this? And then, you know, pretty happy with it. Now all I got to do is just varnish it. Not varnish it, what's it called? Just spray some fixative on it because there's charcoal. So the fixative I use is this. It's, um, I'm making it a milk. So it's natural, it's not toxic. Unlike all the other fixatives I have right now. This one isn't, so that's why I like to use it because I don't have an open space I can just spray in. So sometimes it does leave a bit of a what's it called? It doesn't have like the aerosol stuff. So then you just give it some time to dry. So sometimes it does get drippy and all you can do is just use a tissue and take the extra drip away. Hope you guys enjoyed. Learned something. See ya. Peace.